Um, my name is Faith Musili, and together with my co-host Shell Karyuki, we are going to be the Zoom host for this session. On behalf of the organizers of Saturday Nairobi 2021, we welcome you all to this session. Uh, to the participants, uh, for any questions you have to uh, SMAE, please go to www.slido.com and enter the code hashtag SatardayNairobi08 uh, under, uh, underscore zero eight and type your question. Don't worry, we're going to paste this into the chat. Uh, so let us just use the Zoom chat for any introductions, comments, short comments, and technical hiccups only. Uh, finally, please know that this is a safe place, free of harassment to everyone. So if anyone behaves in any inappropriate manner, we are going to remove you from this session. Um, so ID models. Uh, so as my today we, is going to provide an overview of the ID models ecosystem, collection of our packages that have consistent API and are designed to work together in st uh, streamlining model building. Uh, our packages designed for pre-processing, sampling, model creation, validation, and data visualization will be introduced and explored through an interactive end-to-end -end, uh, example. So more about Asmae. Uh, Asmae is the Director of Analytics and Research at Pasukia a telehealth company specializing in treating substance use disorder. By night, she is the editor-in-chief of Hockey Crafts, a hockey sports analytics blog. So over to you, Asmai. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this session. Um, hi, Vibash, good to see you again. Oh, yes. Hey. <laughs> cool. So I'll just get started in about um, a minute just to give everyone some time to join and get settled. Okay, very cool. So let's get started. Um, once again, I'm Asma and I'll be giving a very gentle, hopefully very gentle introduction to tidy models today. Um, full disclosure before we start, uh, I got acquainted with tidy models just, you know, maybe two or three months ago through a book club that um, got started through the R for DS community. So for those unfamiliar with that, it's a Slack community where R analysts get together and ask each other questions, get some help, and even get together on Zoom calls to discuss R stats books. And I happen to be involved in the Tidy Models one. And so that was really my first exposure to Tidy Models. So I will be giving this talk as someone who, you know, got up to speed with it uh, relatively quickly, but is still a beginner myself. So hopefully this will be interactive. If you have any thoughts, feedback, if you see something that looks off or needs improvement, uh, please let me know via the chat. Okay. So what is tidy models you know what 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 is this all about you know we know there's many many packages out there um, that help us do modeling but tidy models you know what does it do differently um, is it inscribed in anything that already exists within ours ecosystems and it turns out the answer is yes so tidy models represents the R packages inside the tidyverse and the tidy models packages specifically focus on the modeling process. So for those unfamiliar with tidyverse, um, tidyverse is a powerful ecosystem because it shares 
an underlying philosophy, grammar, and data structures, the principles really behind uh, the design and the thought process of Tidyverse is so that the coding is intuitive, so designed for humans. You can reuse data structures. You can leverage functional programming with the piping operator and many other advantages that uh, Tidyverse practitioners have grown to, to really appreciate. And so Tidy Models is really embedded in this Tidyverse ecosystem. And, and so it benefits from having a con consistent API and within Tidy Models, you have individual packages that are designed to do different and narrow things, but also designed to work together to really have that end-to-end -end modeling process. So now that we've gone over what is Tidy Models, the next question is, well, why should we use it? And before we get to why should we use it, why, what was the motivation even behind the creation of Tidy Models, given once again that there are many other packages out there that do uh, similar things? Well, it's really powerful to help you streamline the process really from beginning to end. It allows you to produce high quality models with not that much effort from the analyst. And it also encourages good methodology and statistical practice. And we'll see that through the interactive example we'll be going through together. And I found this quote from the Tidy Models with R book to be really compelling. Um, it says, whenever possible, the software should be able to protect users from committing mistakes. Software should make it easy for users to do the right thing. And I hope that by the end of this session, uh, you'll have an appreciation for how much thought and effort has gone through making Tidy Models as intuitive as it could be. And um, in there is embedded, um, you know, good methodology and statistical practices. Yeah. Yeah. So, Modeling really is inscribed in the data science process. So this is a visualization that I know Tidyverse practitioners uh, may have seen before, and it goes through the different steps really involved in a typical data science workflow, where it starts with importing the data, tidying it, transforming it, visualizing it, and then modeling it. And that's really the part of when we're trying to understand the data and help us make decisions. And then communication is the last part. So today we'll be focusing on this aspect of the workflow, which is the modeling part. But when modeling, we will make, of course, full use of the tidyverse and the visualizations and then the communications aspect of, of those workflows. So the modeling process, um, as the visualization shows, is composed of some general phases, beginning with EDA, exploratory data analysis. So that's when you first you know, import your data, you don't know much about it. You're going to hopefully visualize it and do some aggregate calculations to get an understanding of what that data holds. Uh, after you get familiar with the data, you may start feature engineering. So that's when you start combining um, certain columns of your data, such as maybe getting a ratio of two columns. And that's the process that we call feature engineering. You're basically harnessing the data to make more informative um, data for the purposes of modeling. Then the next phase is model tuning and selection, which in this diagram is represented by the blue circles and the yellow segments. So that's really the middle process right before model evaluation. And once you evaluate your model, you may 
be disappointed with its performance. So you may go back and do some more feature engineering. Um, and then, you know, you're finally to the last phase, which is your final model evaluation. So from this graph, um, really what's being highlighted is there are some general phases and they, are, they can be iterative. This cycle could be repeated as many times as needed. So why is, is it important for modeling to be tidy? Well, just from the graph before, right, we saw that it's an iterative process, which means you may have to repeat several steps multiple times. And if the code, if the approach is repeatable, easily repeatable and tidy, that certainly makes the analyst's job much easier. Uh, why is it all also important to um, stick with one ecosystem, one way of doing things is because once you get acquainted with it once, you don't have to go through the mental effort of learning a new package. And so we can sort of gain an appreciation for this based on the table that's included here. So what that shows is different R packages, which have a similar function called predict but we can see that based on the package, it's used differently and there's different arguments and they can mean different things. So, you know, if you choose to, to use different R packages for your modeling at the same time, then you may, you may run into some confusion with some functions that uh, sound the same, but don't quite do the same thing as you would expect them to. And it's important also for this framework, this tidy models framework to be flexible, can evolve over time and would be easy for contributors to make it better. So how does tidy models make modeling better and easier? We've sort of teased the answer a little bit, but in addition to the advantages uh, given by the tidyverse, the tidy models also leverages object-oriented programming on top of functional programming. It also comes with sensible defaults. So that means if the analyst does not provide arguments, there's already baked in defaults in there, which are reasonable. And that's the, the part that we've discussed earlier in the talk of like, you know, tidy models was designed to help build high quality models and, and with good statistical practices behind that. And those defaults are very much motivated by that. And with the tidy models, you can work with lots of different data structures. So I know that in other modeling packages, you may be limited to just working with matrices which can be a little bit cumbersome for the analyst. And so another question you may be asking yourself if you have used other packages or you have used the carrot ecosystem or MLR is okay. Um, well, what are the differences and um, what are the similarities? And so there's many similarities because they share the same goals of unifying uh, the functions and the grammar and um, many other similarities. But one of the things that sticks out about tiny models is it very much has different design goals and modeling implementations, more efficient implementations. And it is also something that the R Studio team is working um, very heavily on. So we will benefit from, you know, getting acquainted with this tidy models ecosystem, given that many improvements are being added almost daily. So for the next portion of this talk, we're gonna go through a fully worked example from beginning to start. So I will stop sharing my screen momentarily while I pull up my R Markdown document. 
Okay, can everyone see my browser and my R Markdown document? Great, okay. So, you know, as that graphic shows of the data science workflow, the first step we're going to do is sort of a setup step, which is to import all the packages that we will be using. So some here uh, hopefully will look familiar, the here package, tidyverse, janitor, tidy models, the star of the show, and some additional packages we will make use of. So if you don't already have these packages and you want them installed on your computer, I highly recommend making use of the pack package, which is a package that helps you install packages. And it's, it's, it's really neat, it's very fast and um, less cumbersome than install packages. So today as uh, an example, for a data set, we'll be using the 2021 World Happiness Report, which um, was featured on Kaggle. And it is a data set which contains information regarding the state of happiness in the world. So it contains happiness scores and rankings from the Gallup World Poll as well as additional information that can explain variation between countries in this happiness score. I will make this a little bigger. Let me know if everyone can see this. If not, I can try to make it uh, a little bigger. But the information uh, contained in this data set, um, there's economic um, sort of indices, there's social support, there's life expectancy, there's freedom, absence of corruption, and generosity. So from this data set, after importing it, uh, cleaning the column names, I've selected the variables that I was personally interested in with the outcome first, first and foremost, which is the ladder score, that's the happiness score. I took GDP, so gross domestic product per capita, social support, life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and perception of corruption. And so at this stage, um, this is when you would start your EDA. You would look at some of these variables. You would ask yourself, do we have um, uh, which are numeric, which ones are factors, uh, maybe do some visualizations to see if there are any relationships between some of these variables and so on. But for the interest of time, and given that I was already familiar with this data set, I skipped the EDA process, but that is very much a very important one to do early on. For modeling, the first thing you're going to want to do is to split this data. So this is an important part of validating a model. That's why we split and we split as the first step. So essentially what you're going to be doing with the split is making a training set and a test set. So the training set is used for model development and optimization. So you can almost think of it as your sandbox. You're trying different things and seeing what works and what doesn't work. While the test set is something you leave completely off to the side until you're done playing and you've identified one or a couple models that have worked really well on your training set. And then you really find out if it does well on data it has never seen before, which is the true test of if your models are fit correctly. So the test set really is used to determine the ultimate efficacy of the models you have chosen. So it's very important that it is something that is kept completely separate until the very end. So for this data set, we will perform what's called stratified sampling using the default three to one ratio of training to test. 
And stratified sampling without going through too many details is a sampling technique that is particularly well suited for data that may have class imbalance, but also there's really never a drawback to using stratified sampling. It's one of those things I think that is better safe than sorry. So I tend to always go with stratified sampling and that's what I did here. And then we're going to resample the training set using five repeats of tenfold cross-validation. And if I'm losing many of you right now, um, that's normal. <laughs> when I was first you know, learning about modeling, um, I was on the same boat. I needed you know, multiple blog posts to, to really wrap my head around not only the concept of splitting, but also the concept of resampling. So if you are on that boat, the Tidy Models book is really, really nice because it not only goes through the technical aspects of like, you know, the, the packages, but it also explains um, the purpose of, of, of all the things that we do. And so it can be a really uh, useful resource if you're wanting to learn about statistical techniques through coding and programming. So with that being said, um, hopefully I didn't lose all of you. Uh, you can achieve this um, training, test splitting and resampling using the R sample package, which is in the tidy models uh, ecosystem. And this creates a special split object. So the way to do it after setting our seed is we're gonna call upon initial split and we're going to say, okay, please perform this stratified sampling based on the outcome variable ladder score. We're gonna save our training set as happiness train and we're gonna save our testing set as happiness test. And then we're going to do our cross validation with the fold CV. A good step always is to inspect the object we have made. So happiness splits as expected. It has been split appropriately with that three to one ratio that we expected. So we have here analysis. So that is going to be our training set composed of 109 observations, our test set of 40 observations for a total of 149. Okay, so once we've uh, done that step, uh, we are going to make our recipe. So this will call upon the recipe package inside Tiny, Tiny Models, which allows you to specify the role of each variable. Like what are they there for? Are they an outcome or are they a predictor variable? And it also allows you to specify any pre-processing steps that you will require. So that's really, you know, the feature engineering part of the workflow we, we looked at earlier. So to set up this recipe, you first specify the formula. So you assign a role to each variable that you have. And then you also specify the pre-processing steps. So those pre-processing steps could be things like normalizing, um, interaction terms, maybe something a little bit more complicated like principal component analysis, scaling, centering, et cetera. In our case, we're gonna specify two recipes. Recipe number one for models where the predictors are going to have to be scaled and centered and our recipe number two is going to be for models where we want to use quadratic and interaction terms. And so from this approach, you can see that, you know, you can stick with just one recipe or have two. It really depends on which models you think you're going to be utilizing later. And so given that I know there's going to be some models later that I know will have to have quadratic and interaction terms, that's why I've created two recipes. The first recipe I'm calling recipe norm for the normalized recipe. And you can see here, 
we're once again making full use of the tidyverse here with the piping operator and we're calling upon recipe with this really neat shorthand and for those that have modeled before and used lm or, or glm that's a shorthand which allows us to say okay please fit this model that predicts the outcome using all the other columns and then after that step number two which is specifying the pre-processing steps this is where we're doing that we're saying okay please normalize all the predictors and in here this is this helpful little function here so instead of having to type out all your columns you can make use of this really neat um, all predictors selector similarly for our recipe number two the first step we do is to specify the recipe and then give it the uh, pre-processing steps so the first one is to inject polynomial terms, polynomial terms, and then the second one is to inject interaction terms. And it again makes use of this, like all predictors role selector. So now that we've made, we've set up our recipes, we can also inspect this, this recipe and, and see, you know, how many outcome variables and how many predictor variables there are in this recipe and as expected we only have one outcome which is happiness so so that checks out and we indeed have six predictors and it also gives you the pre-processing steps that you've specified so that's under operations centering and scaling for all predictors similarly for recipe poly same deal one outcome six predictors and these are the operations, so the pre-processing steps that are specified in this recipe. Step number three is to uh, identify the models that we want to use and to specify them further. So we're going to be making use of the parsnip package to do this. And the parsnip package is a a unified interface for model selection and specification. It contains a lot of models. It's not exhaustive, of course, but it contains most that analysts may want to be using. And so for proper model selection and specification, you're gonna need to specify the model type. So uh, that's really, like the model desired. So things like a random forest, if you want a random forest, or you want a linear regression, or you want k-nearest neighbor, et cetera. There is a really helpful add-in if you want to take a glance at all the models that are supported and copy them right into your script. And so let me see if it cooperates with me here. I need to move my zoom. So under add-ins and then generate parsnip model specifications, there's basically a shiny app that opens here and you can take a look at all the models that are supported. And if you want to select any of them, you just click on a few and then you press on this right specification code and it, um, writes it for you. So that's exactly what I did. I did not type all of these by hand. I certainly made use of that add-in and I was able to import one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different models uh, all written out for me. And the cool thing too is that it tagged this like tune function to the parameters that I need tuning. So that's nice. It also took care of step number two and three. So step number two is we have to specify the engine. Uh, so that was a little tricky to me to understand at first, but it basically has to do with the fact that there's the, the model could be using underlying packages. So for the case of random forest, you may want to specify the ranger 
implementation of random forest. So that's something that, you know, if you're interested in using a model, be sure to, to check the documentation and see which implementations exist and which are more suited for, for, your, for your data. And you can set this engine using the set engine argument. And then the third thing that needs to be specified is the mode. So the type of prediction, whether you're doing classification or regression, and you can do that with set mode. And so um, as, as discussed, uh, when you make use of the add-in function, it already comes uh, nicely written out for you like this. So my recommendation, it would be to just glance over it and make sure that your mode is, is the correct one. In this case, we have a continuous predictor. So we will be using set mode regression for, for all of these. And if for some reason it had said classification, then that would have been something that I needed to go and, and correct. So definitely, you know, even if you're importing it, make sure you're giving this a glance and that it makes sense. All right, so as you can see, we're gonna be trying out 10 different models. Uh, you can see this tune being tagged to lots of parameters. So we're definitely gonna be moving on to a tuning step in which we try different parameter values and we're gonna try to see okay, um, which of these parameter values for which models end up having the best performance overall. Okay, so before tuning, um, we need to sort of put it all together, right? So we like specified our recipes, we've set up the models that we wanna be using, but we need to bring them together into what's called a workflow or workflow sets. So you can use the workflow sets package to do this. And what you do is you call upon the workflow set function, and then you add in your recipe and your model to it. In our case, we'll actually be creating workflow sets for three recipes. And this may be tricky because I said I made two recipes, but Workflow set number one is going to be for the models using the normalized recipe. Workflow set number two is going to be for the models using the polynomial recipe. And workflow set three is for models that actually don't require any of these pre-processing steps, because there are some that don't require any, you know, normalization or any, anything having to do with quadratic terms or interaction terms, like that's not needed. So that's why I have created three workflow sets. And at the end, I combine all of these sets into one object. Like so. And then you can, of course, inspect your sets object and just make sure that it has everything as you would expect. Okay. So the next step is the tuning, right? Because we have all these uh, parameters and we wanna try out different values for them. So basically the goal here, once again, is to see which model for which parameter values give us the best uh, model performance. And so if you have selected models that don't have any parameters to tune, then this would be a step that you could uh, skip in your workflow. In this example, um, there's different flavors of tuning. There's different approaches. The one selected here for this example is grid search via racing approach. It's thought of as more efficient and there's a nice mathy technical explanation for why that is in the Taibi Models with R textbook by Max and Julia. So if you're interested in learning more, please consult that part. And I was overly ambitious and I, have, I was on my work computer, which has 64 gigabytes of RAM. And I'm like, I'm gonna try a hundred different parameter candidates because I can. And that's what I did. Um, it took a long time <laughs> to tune over that. 
Um, so much so that I had to save uh, my results uh, locally and then re-import them for further manipulation because you know re-rendering this document would have taken um, way too long. So once we've tuned and we've tried all these different combinations, we've saved them under this res grid object. Now we're going to evaluate the performance. So we'll be making use still of the workflow sets package and the tune package. So first we're gonna use rank results to rank these models by the performance metric that is suited for our problem. So in this case, it's, in this case, it's RMSC. And then we're gonna be using select best from the tune package inside an auto plot, which will give us a graph to rank models using their best tuning parameter combination. So basically, once again, we see the tidyverse being used in, in, in full display here because really all the outputs of um, tidy models is tibbles. So they're very, they're very easy to manipulate using um, the tidyverse verbs that um, you know. So in this case, I've basically just arranged the models by the RMSC uh, going from lowest to highest because the lower the RMSC, the better. So we can see here that our support vector machine model did the best here. If we're more visually inclined, you can pass this object inside autoplot, respecify the performance metric, which is RMSC, and just see again, which ones did the best. So we have the support vector machine followed by the random forest, followed by the boosted trees as the models that did the best. Okay. So basically in this part, um, you, you are still in your sandbox. So you're still you know, working with your training set. In this part, you can go back, change some things. Maybe you wanna try different features. Maybe you wanna try different models altogether. You're just like not that happy with these. Um, you can certainly do that and it can be an iterative process that can be as long uh, as, as you'd like it to. But once, once you make the decision that you're happy and that you're gonna start messing with the test set, that is really the point of um, no return here. So that's step number seven, which is evaluating the performance on the test set. So really that's the final step in choosing then the best model and evaluating its performance. So first, you know, we're going to pull out this, this the best model um, using pull workflow set result from the workflow sets package. Then we're gonna use finalize workflow and last fit from the tune package to fit on the full training set. And then we're gonna be using collect metrics from the tune package to see results on the test set. So as expected, the best performing model is the support vector machine. And you can also pull out the RMSC for it like so by using select best and it will reveal that along with the best parameter combination. So for this model, it had two parameters, the cost and the degree, and this is the best combination that results in the lowest RMSC. So here we can use finalize workflow and last fit and then collect the metrics to see how it does on the test set. So that's really our moment of truth here. And we have an RMSC of 0.530.
And then you can collect the predictions as well and get all of them. And this is a really nice sanity check because if you inspect the size of this tibble, it's 40 observations. And that's exactly what we had when we split. So indeed, we've, we've, done, we've done our process uh, correctly and ended up testing this accurately on the right object. And so at this point, you know, once again, because it's a tibble, you can do any further manipulations to it. You can do data visualizations. You can tease out these predictions. You can predict on new data. Um, just a really, really flexible um, framework here to work with if you want to further inspect your results or um, export them. And I did an extra step here, step number eight, given the popularity of the stacks package as of late. So the stacks package is also in tidy models and it's used for ensembling. And ensembling is a process that involves combining the output of many candidate models to generate a new model. And when you do that, it often beats out your previous model. So it's this combining that's, that's really the value added here. And what it involves is fitting a, regu a regularized linear model to the predictions of the candidate models. And so essentially the outputs of those candidate models serve as the predictors for the true outcome variable. That's a mouthful. Um, but Simon Couch, who is a developer for this Stacks package, um, has a really nice overview diagram of how this, this works. And the implementation um, is first you define those candidate ensemble members, you collect them, you initialize a data stack object with the function stacks. You iteratively add these candidate ensemble members to the data stack with add candidates. You evaluate how to combine their predictions with blend predictions. You fit the candidate ensemble members with non-zero stacking coefficients with fit members, and then you predict on new data with predict. It is a mouthful. Once again, um, don't worry if it's not all making sense right now, but I think the, the take home message here is that you can do ensembling if you want to eke out a further, possibly further uh, predictive uh, performance. And so I've put check marks here um, just to um, just to say that we've already done these steps from the previous ones. So we're going to be going directly to initializing this stack with stacks and then adding the candidate models with add candidates. And so our candidates here is this resgrid object that, that we've made previously. And then you go on to combine all these predictions and you fit the candidates with non-zero stacking coefficients on the full training set. And finally, you get predictions with predict. And you can see how like sparse all, all this syntax is. So you could really do ensembling with just a, a few lines of code, which is, which is really neat. And so we can take a look here at the output and we can see that the stacked ensemble actually outperforms um, the model that we've made previously, given the RMSC is um, 0.48, uh, whereas previously we saw that it was 0.52. So that's a very high level overview of what a workflow might look like 
for you if you use tiny models. So just to recap, we start with the data, we import it, we do some EDA. The first very critical step is to split it into a training and a test set. Then you specify your recipe. So you tell, you know, you specify which is my outcome variable, which are my predictors. And then from there you go, okay, well, this is what I wanna do with the predictors. These are the manipulations I wanna do. And that sets your recipe up. Then the next step is, okay, well, which models do I wanna use? I wanna use a random forest. I wanna use boosted trees. I wanna use linear regression. So that's when you specify them. In that specification, you're gonna be mindful of specifying both the engine. So that's like the implementation of the model. And you're going to also be specifying which parameters in that model you're gonna be wanting to tune. So then the next step is just to put your recipe together with the model specifications, and then you start the tuning process, which is basically trying out different parameter values such that you hopefully get a combination that outperforms all the other combinations. And so once you do that, you really pull that model that has the best combination for parameter values. And that's the one you use on your test set, which you've been holding out for the entire time. So you use it on your test set to really get an idea of how well your model may perform in real life. So for data that it has never seen before. And the reason why we do that is, is because, you know, if you don't go through the exercise of the test set um, you may fall into the trap of overfitting. And that's why you could have really good performance on your training set, but then in real life, your model um, suffers. So it's important to go through this step and also being mindful um, that it's an iterative process. So if you're not happy with the cross-validation performance, you can always go back and change it. And that's really where tidy models shines, I think, is because if you decide to do other models, if you decide on other pre-processing techniques, you don't have to rewrite the whole thing. It's pretty easy. You just switch them in and out and it's, it's way less cumbersome that way. So that's what I've got for you guys today. I hope that this was insightful and not too overwhelming. If it was overwhelming, please note that that's okay. That's normal, it's expected. Um, I know that when I was going through the tidy models with our textbook, I've had to reread chapters multiple times and sit down with my friends and ask them questions. So I'm happy to be that resource for you as best as I could. Uh, if you're interested, in you know starting to implement models in tidy models please know that there's a really healthy collaborative um, set of people in the r4ds channel um, that could help you in that journey so thank you very much <laughs> yay thank you so much um Asma. that was wonderful um the tidy frame the tidy models uh, framework is really exciting now I'll be leading the Q and A, and I think you've already um, answered <laughs> one of the questions we have. Um, but I'll still ask it um, in case you have more to add. So someone says, "Wow, what materials did you use to learn all this?" That was a nice uh, presentation. Teddy models looks and sounds interesting. Yeah, so um, the question is, how did I get up to speed really with all of this? And it's with a lot of help, honestly. Um, I think this book, you know, when you go through it, you'll realize that they didn't write it for already, pro already like really skilled programmers and like statisticians. They, they understood that a lot of people use R and will be using tidy models to learn those statistical techniques. And so it's just fantastic. It goes through fully worked examples, like explaining why we split, you know, why we tune, 
why we go through cross-validation performance before we go on to the test set. It's really, really well explained in this book. And also if for some reason these explanations are still not sufficient, then I, I think at the end of every chapter, there's more references to check out. Um, you know, an example right over here, right? You know, for general background on the most common type of model, we suggest Fox. So you could go to Fox and get like further clarification on, on the topic. Um, but really it was, it was from reading this book very, very carefully. And I think a motivation for me to read it carefully was being involved in the book club with R4DS. So that book club basically met on Zoom every week and someone presents a chapter. So they don't present it as a expert, right? They present it as someone who literally just read it like the day before, two days before and did slides together and comes in, presents it, but also asks questions to the group and people in the group try to answer those questions. So we really try to like figure it out together and we motivate each other to start like implementing these, these verbs and these techniques on data sets that we find exciting. So in this case, like this world happiness report data set was something that um, my friend Tony was like, oh, that's a cool data set on Kaggle. Like I'm gonna try out some of these techniques on that one. And so it can be it can be really fun and engaging. And I think you know when you're learning things, it's always good to do it in a in a group. Um, but okay. you know it takes it takes just a, a lot of a lot of time and discipline. But it's something that I found to be really really worthwhile because once I get up to speed with the basics of of tiny models, then I don't have any reason to to get up to speed with you know the twenty or thirty other packages that do the same thing in R, but have different syntax and different philosophy and different um, limitations, so yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question, what would you say is one weakness of tidy models as compared to other machine learning frameworks? So I'm an R programmer, I'm not a Pythonista, so I cannot speak to you know, tidy models counterparts in other languages. However, within R itself, tidy models has um, many advantages over others. So I don't think I can quite see a weakness in tidy models, except for the fact that, you know, it is newer. So there may be some models and some implementations that exist in Carrot that don't yet exist in tidy models. Uh, but I know that, you know, if it's something that you really, really need implemented in tidy models that is only implemented in Carrot, then I definitely do recommend getting in touch with um, the tidy models developers and get an idea of when it may go live in tidy models. So I think that may be a weakness, but honestly, just looking from looking at Parsnip package, like if you look at that add in and see all the models that are already offered. Um, I, I, I think most people will be quite satisfied with the offerings right now in tiny models. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, what do you think is the future of tiny models? What are the developers currently working on? Yeah, so it's 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 a it's a really a new framework. It's impressive how much they've been able to do. But I know that, you know, I've, I've said we're, we're doing a book club on this, on tidy models, and we had to stop our book club basically because we already finished all the chapters that were publicly available. They just added more. Um, and so it's just like constantly developing um, ecosystem and modeling itself is also something that is constantly changing. So I can't say her holds for tidy models in that regard, but I know that it's constantly being moved on to make it more intuitive and to make it more complete to just make sure that everything that Carrot already offers or MLR already offers is being integrated in tidy models. I know they're doing a lot of work too for like model interpretation, helper packages like Dalex and, and stuff like that. So stay tuned. I think the best way to to get an idea of what they're working on for tidy models is just to go on their GitHub page. You'll see the issues and you'll see all the 
enhancements that they're that they're currently working on. Okay, thank you. Um, for someone used to carrot, how steep is the learning curve for understanding tidy models? I would say not very. I wasn't a heavy user of carrot. I like knew what it was about and I had used it maybe a couple of times, but I think um, it'll make you feel better to know that it's Max who was developing carrot for the most part. And he's the one um, also leading tidy models. So I think you'll find that there's a lot of, of similarities between them. So the learning curve um, may not may not be as steep as you think once you get into it. Okay. Um, sorry. How how is the process? How is the process different with conventional statistical methods like logistic regression and other models? Sure. So with tidy models, you can, you can do all of those things. You can do logistic regression, linear regression, all the traditional statistical techniques, plus additionally machine learning techniques as well. What tidy models allows you to do better is just to have that consistent grammar, consistent like way of dealing with the outputs of your model Whereas, you know, you could use GLM or LM, um, but it's not quite as streamlined as it is with tidy models. Okay, thanks. The last question um, for this session is the tidy models framework being used widely in the industry? I believe it, it's going to start being widely adopted just because of the ease of how it's used. And I know I didn't say this to the previous question of like, what are they working on? What are they developing? What is the future of tidy models? I think they're going to really strengthen um, the capabilities and the documentation of how to deploy tidy models in production. So I think, you know, I think right now it's just a matter of like strengthening documentation and like helper tutorials. I know that people have already put like tidy model um, outputs into production, but I think that's something that's really exciting for me, honestly, um, as someone that's fairly new to this is just to have that, that extra documentation and help. So I, I definitely see, see this being, um, something that will grow it within industry pretty rapidly. Okay, um, that's it for this session. Thank you so much, Asma, for yeah, the wonderful yeah. training and to the participants for joining this session. Teddy Models is such an interesting um, framework. Next, we are going to take a five to 10 minutes break. Um, you can stretch, you can, you can take some water, um, and then we're going to come back and hear from Dr. Ilya Kashnitsky on how to create powerful data viz with R. Yeah, um, that's it from us for okay. this session. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good one. And thank Bye. you, Trust My for. For, for sorry for those who've come in late, like it, it was too early for you. Um, and we are really <laughs> grateful on behalf of the organizers. We are, we are really, really, really grateful that um, you joined us today. And um, we hope, like, I can't wait to see a lot of people just embracing Teddy models, especially in Kenya right now. So, Definitely. Yeah. And I will be, I will be sharing um, my materials on GitHub so you guys could follow along with the examples. Okay, okay, okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a great one, everyone. Bye. Bye.